Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, I hope that in spite of our uh, bad weather and the sickness going around, um, that you're having a good day today. And thank you for joining us for our Sunday morning uh, sermon uh, remotely at this point. Uh, we'll be back on Wednesday uh, for our normal meeting time, um, God willing. And we will also be uh, continuing with our series um, on the book, The Story. So if you haven't been following along with that, uh, there is a uh, link to that on the YouTube page where we are uh, right now for this video. Uh, so uh, go ahead and look at that on our channel and you'll be able to follow along as we go through the rest of the series as well. Uh, and we will be continuing to share that um, teaching opportunity between myself, uh, Frank Grilly, and Brian Weekly. So look forward to seeing some different perspectives as we go through those lessons as well. For our sermon today, we're going to be looking at a passage um, from the Gospel of Luke. And specifically, we're going to be reading the uh, chapter in which Jesus has sent out and received back the 70 from what we sometimes call the limited commission rather than the great commission that comes at the end of the Gospels. Um, and also contains the parable of the Good Samaritan. I'll be reading selections from these verses uh, as we go through our chapter today. But if you'd like to take some time now, go ahead and pause the video, go through and read this chapter on your own, listen to it on your favorite audiobook, whatever you want to do, um, and come back. Uh, this would be a good opportunity to do that uh, as we go through this and sort of hit some of the high points going through our lesson today. First of all, Jesus is sending out uh, 70 of his disciples to go on a missionary uh, excursion, a preaching tour, if you will. Uh, and their instructions are very specific. He describes the situation this way, starting in verse 2. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be with this house. And if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you, and heal those in it who are sick, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, Even the dust of your city which clings to our feet we wipe off and protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. So Jesus uh, is telling these people to go out and to start preaching the good news of the arrival of the kingdom of God uh, among God's people. Specifically, these are Jewish men going to speak to Jewish men and talking about the fact that the Messiah has come, that, the, that Jesus being the new king uh, of Israel, the true king, has arrived. And uh, to what extent they understand the, the true outcome of that message is question in question. Um, of course, it, it would seem that many people at Jesus' death scattered, not really understanding the full message. But that says something about the message that we're looking at today. The 70 were sent to all out to do a mission that they weren't fully prepared for. They were going to their own people and proclaiming that the kingdom had come near, yes. Uh, and they came back Pro professing that they had the power over evil spirits, and they seemed to be quite pleased with their success. You see, Jesus was giving them the authority to also heal and to do good among the people that they were coming into contact with. They were doing things in his name, after all. When they return, they say this, verse 17, 
The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. So he didn't want these people to get caught up in some sort of spiritual warfare where they were suddenly emboldened with this power that they wouldn't have had without him. And to suddenly take on this combating of spiritual enemies as part of their value or their worth as people. Specifically, what Jesus said is their real value was that their names that they had they were taking away from the situation was that their names were recorded in heaven. Continuing on, um, Jesus is talking to them and saying, uh, at that very time he rejoiced great, greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So Jesus is talking about that these men who were like infants, they were like little babies in the understanding of the faith, not really understanding the message he was giving them, the message they were speaking, and in definitely in the ways uh, that the uh, religious elite of the time would have measured it, they were not adequate um, to be teaching in any sort of authoritative way. And yet this was the task that they had been given uh, and Jesus says that he revealed the Father to them through himself. And he was the only way for other people to see the Father. Continuing on in verse 23, turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wish for, to see the things which you see and did not see them, to hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. He's speaking to these men who have just come back. Um, and those who are around them. This is the, you know, his disciples, a very close group of people to him. And telling them that the things that they were witness to, the things that they had become an expert on, that they were the ones who could testify um, towards these events, um, were the things that all of the big, important, powerful people wanted to get a hold of. Kings and prophets wanted to see the things that they were seeing, but they couldn't. These men were indeed in a special position. So now that we've got this set up, these ordinary men have gone out and done all of this important work because of the name of Jesus. Um, the commands he has given them have been carried out. They've healed people. They've um, done such good work that Jesus says he saw Satan falling from heaven like lightning um, at the results of what they were doing. Um, the accuser, the prosecuting attorney, because it's really what the name Satan means, it's the one who accuses, um, had been thrown out of God's heavenly court. He was no longer on the stand or, you know, holding us to any sort of account uh, before God and making accusations, just as we saw in Job's story in the Old Testament. That's really built into the language um, around Satan, around our adversary, the devil, is that he's the one who's trying to convince God that we're guilty. And Jesus says that he's been thrown out of court. So, seeing that, um, and that there wasn't any sort of cleverness or you know, deep knowledge of the Bible that was needed to do this. These men were preaching because of the conviction of their hearts and were effective because of their faith in healing and casting out spirits. Now we're going to see one of those so-called experts show up. In verse 25, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, 
You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? So you see, this lawyer, while I do believe that he was probably a man of good character and a man of great understanding of the law, he's probably quite an intelligent person as well. You see, uh, these lawyers weren't necessarily what we think of in Hollywood, which is not a fair picture of actual lawyers anyway, um, or even what we think of as lawyers in real life. These aren't people who are experts in some sort of secular law and are looking for, especially in Hollywood dramatizations and fictional versions, always looking for loopholes, looking for tricks, looking for ways that they can get around um, the way the law is supposed to work. Instead, uh, these lawyers were people of high character who were held to a very high standard of conduct and were experts in the scriptures, in the Old Testament law. And because they were experts in the Old Testament scriptures, these lawyers were people who deeply and personally, as well as practically understood what the actual words of the scripture were and how they could be applied. But also because of this, they were almost too close to the word. And notice what he says, who is my neighbor? Now Jesus is going to answer his question with a parable and then a question. So listen to this. Jesus replied and said, A man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down the road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever you spend, uh, more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell in the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him then Jesus said, go and do the same. So the lawyer, the expert in the law, the guy who was really good at understanding what the letter of the law was, and was undoubtedly someone who believed that he had held to the letter of that law very well, was still lacking in something. And Jesus drew it out through this lesson. We can see it in the way he talks, because Jesus um, presents him with these three people who pass by the man, a priest, a Levite, and then a Samaritan. The priest and the Levite pass by, but the Samaritan comes and does good for the man. He bandages his wounds and takes him to an inn, um, which effectively was a hospital of the day where the man could have a bed until he was healed. So Jesus took this question, which was directed at the letter of the law. Specify for me, Jesus, who in fact is my neighbor? What does the law say about neighbors and how do I determine if someone is owed my goodness. If I am supposed to love my neighbor as myself, how do I find that person so that I can love them and no one else? Jesus turned that around and said, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell in the robber's hands? And the man has to reply, the one who showed mercy towards him. What we can see there is that as much as the lawyer understood the letter of the law, he had some difficulty in understanding the spirit of the law. 
he had some difficulty understanding what the character of a person who understood the law was really supposed to be like. Because it didn't just have to do with a high ability to conform to the, the actual commands of the law, but it was rather the intent of the one who wrote it. And we were supposed to, he was supposed to be, we are supposed to be, following the pattern of God's heart, the person who would write a law about loving your neighbor, and finding the way that that is supposed to manifest, what that's supposed to look like when we're doing it in our lives, versus just, now, what does this mean so I can check it off of my list of things that I've done right? The question of the letter of the law is often easily answered. Do you want to know where the line is so you can make sure you don't cross it? The Bible's pretty clear on a lot of that stuff. But when it comes to the spirit of the law, when it comes to understanding where something's coming from, it's actually sometimes harder for those of us who know more to do good. Those men who went out in the limited commission, who went out with the 70, and misunderstood Jesus, probably, with all likelihood, misunderstood what his role was. They were thinking they were going to get an earthly king out of this Messiah, but instead they got a sacrificial lamb. They still did the right thing by coming to people and saying, the kingdom of heaven is among you. They knew what that meant because they could see the healing happening with their own hands. They could see the spirits leaving those who were suffering at their own hands. So if you're struggling with what it looks like to be a Christian in your life, you don't have to look deeper into a better, fuller, more concrete understanding of what God's commands are, because that could lead you to self-deception, to eliminating people that you can do good for. What you really need to focus on, first and foremost, is an absolutely practical application of what you already know. God wants you to do good for other people. He wants you to be the, the person like Jesus. He wants you to be a healer. He wants you to be a helper. And he wants you to be a comfort to those who are around you. And by giving the good news that the kingdom of heaven is among you, they will have that understanding that you have. That same basic level of understanding that doesn't need any requirements or backing up that you can start with and grow from there. Now, if you can become a lawyer, you can become an expert in the law, you can become an expert in the scriptures, great. That's perfect. We need people like that. But they also need to be neighbors. You can be both, but just be both. Don't limit yourself and don't limit God by sticking to the lawyer side of things. Make sure that you are living the love that God has given to you as you give it to other people. I hope our message today has been a blessing and an encouragement to you and something that you can apply to your life. Uh, I would now like to take an opportunity, has, has been requested uh, by a congregation in the past, to give a blessing for the communion emblems um, for those who are worshiping at home this week. Dear God, we thank you for the bread and the fruit of the vine, which represent your body and your blood respectively which were part of that sacrifice that was given for us at the cross. We pray as we partake of these things that we do so in a way that shows a right heart and a right attitude towards you, and that we can do so gratefully and with a mindset that is continuing to grow closer to being like you and not like ourselves and not like our selfish needs and not like our used to be, but rather what we can be in you. Thank you for all of these things, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.